All right, class, hey, let's get going. This will be lesson one. I don't know if you can see my laundry basket in the background. Let's just move over here slightly. Um, lesson one, let me share my screen. By the way, I have um, this uh, whole world of COVID, or as I say, BOC because of COVID. I have to research one, BOC because of COVID. LOL had to come from somewhere. So the WTF, right? Second one is, um, I think you're on mute. You know, I'm not. Third is, hold on, let me share my screen. Let me share my screen here. All right, let's go to play from start. Hopefully you can see me, at least, at least see the, uh, the slide. So um, business 146, money management, or is it called uh, um, money management or money management? It was also called personal finance as well. So anyway, let's go through lesson one. Before we start, um, what, there's three simple questions related to, to finance. One, I'm not, actually, I, I, I take it back, not related to finance. What is the name of the youngest adult slash Kardashian Jenner, of, of youngest adult, the Kardashian slash Jenner female? Give me a few times to think about that. Two, what local team just actually this is about, about eight, this question is about a year old. What what local team won a NBA championship within the last year or so? Three, what is the name of the shoe and clothing brand served by Kanye West? You probably all know the answers to these questions. The first one, Kylie. Or there could be a I don't know, one of her kids or something who I don't know. Um, second one, Lakers. Lakers won the championship. Not this past year, the year before. Right? Third one is Yeezys. You all know that. Excellent. Great job. Give yourself a pat the back. Now I got three more questions for you. What does APR stand for? What does, what's the difference between a subsidized and unsubsidized college student loan? The third, what is an acceptable amount of your monthly budget to be allocated to, for your housing? You probably kick butt on the first three questions. Maybe not so much on the second three questions. That's what this class is going to do. The class class is not going to make, make you a financial expert or an expert with money, but it's going to make you more familiar with concepts, with things that are kind of, and, and hopefully develop some good habits moving forward. So first one, APR just basically stands for your annual percentage rate, also known as your interest rate. You'll see that a lot on credit cards. What's the difference between a subsidized and unsubsidized? And we'll get more into that as we go through the class. Subsidized versus unsubsidized college student loan. Subsidized student loan is usually done through the government. And for the most part, you don't, have, you don't have to start paying on that, the balance of what you borrow until after you graduate. Um, you can start paying the interest if you wanted to. And unsubsidized is not done through the government. So as soon as, as, soon as you make that agreement to get a college student loan through an unsubsidized, if you do it at the beginning of the month, usually by that following month, you're, you're starting to pay back on that. Un, uh, on a subsidized, you don't have to do that. Um, and then what's an acceptable amount of your monthly budget to, be, uh, to go towards your housing? Usually about 30, 35% is, is uh, an acceptable amount. Why is money important? Or is money important? Of course it is. Why? Standard of living. If not, and, and it's gonna be very easy for you to kind of money shame people throughout this class, but I, I, but I encourage you not to. Most people make the best financial decisions given the situations they had at that time. So um, money is important for to have a certain standard of living. I mean, it's also important, you know, for your retirement to accumulate wealth. We'll get into all that stuff later. How do we? How do you get a better standard of living? You earn money and you effectively manage your money. I can't tell you how to earn more money. Um, uh, even though I could give you some career advice um, with my with my regular day job, and with my uh, charge of career services over at Chapman. Um, but for this class, that's not the, that's not the point of this class. Earn money and effectively manage your money. The, the relationship most people have with money is more psychological than anything. It's not uncommon for people who do not make a lot of money to be much better with their money than people who do make a lot of money and, and have a higher worth. So, and you, it's not uncommon for you to see, see people who long-term have more savings, who earned a lot less over their career than people who, who earned a lot more. Because once again, it's a psychological um, relationship with money. How do you accumulate wealth? earn money and effectively manage your money. Max, we'll get into about how to uh, effectively manage your money the best. 
medium versus mean. This is something that, that, that's good to know. Just a little kind of a throwing this out there as a, as a quick little concept. Medium versus mean, they sound the same. Mean is essentially the average. You'll see, you'll see this used a lot in, um, you'll read an article about, you know, the median house price or home price is whatever. So let's say, for example, they said the median house price is $700,000 in a certain area, just for example, right? Versus the mean house price is $700,000. Here's the difference. The mean is simply the average. The median is the number that's in the middle. So you could literally, <coughs> excuse me, you can literally have three house, three homes, right? One is valued at zero, which would never happen. Just, just pay attention for this example. One is, is valued at zero. Um, uh, I take this back. You have, let's, say you, let's say you have two. You have two examples here. One is valued at zero, which one half will never happen. And one is valued at 1.4 million. Then the mean is 700,000. You just take, you know, that, that you take all, you, you just add up the numbers and divide it by, you know, how many um, 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 uh, variables you have. Okay. Median is different. So in a median, you would take Let's say you have 2,000 homes that you're looking at the price, the, the values, right? You start from the, from the bottom. This is not a Drake song. You start from, the, from, the, from, from the, the lowest price all the way up to the highest price. Let's say you have 2,000 homes in there. And then you, and you put them in order of the lowest at the bottom all the way up to the highest. Whatever that number is in the middle is the median. So you'll, you'll hear that term used a lot. Financial goals. I love this saying. I use this in my marketing classes. Um, in every class, it's just a really great saying. The goal without a plan is just a wish. Meaning that you could have the best goal in, in place, but if you don't have a plan, your goal is absolutely worthless. Let's say your goal is, I wanna lose 15 pounds. Awesome goal, how are you gonna do it? So your goal is, I want to have $10,000 saved up in the next um, you know, uh, year. Great, how? I want to get a 4.0 for all my classes. That's my, I'm a GPA to be a 4.0. Great goal. How the heck are you going to do it? So the how is way more important than the what in any type of goal. If it's financial goals, it's personal goals. If it's um, something that, that anything that you want to accomplish, so just remember to keep that in mind. We'll get into SMART goals. I love SMART goals. SMART goals is something that you can use too at a future date in a job or in some setting, and you can look really, really smart. No pun intended. Um, yeah, but SMART goals are goals are, are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Okay, you can apply this to anything. Uh, uh, but for your finances, let's say you wanted to, yeah, I want to be, I want to, in, in the next, in 10 years, um, own a home, have a net worth, and we'll get into what the net worth means later. Uh, the net worth of, you know, at a, of a million dollars and um, have my cars paid off for, student loans paid off for, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, that's a SMART goal, okay? Because, because it's specific, you're very specific about it. It's measurable, you can really measure it. It's attainable, sure. Uh, um, it's realistic, attainable and realistic can overlap. And it's timely, so I said in 10 years. If somebody says, here's a SMART goal of, yeah, you know, I hey, currently I'm not working, but in the next six months I want to be worth, you know, you know, at fifteen. No, currently I'm not work. I'm not working, but you know, pretty soon here I'm going to be worth, uh, you know, fifteen million bucks. Okay, first of all, you don't have a time element on there. You're not. You don't have a job, and maybe in soon you mean by three months. We don't. We don't know about that. It's not specific. It's not measurable. It's not attainable. It's not realistic, and it's not timely. This is something really good that you can do for basically anything, um, um, as well. Overview of what we're going to cover in this class. Your plan to achieve your financial goals. We look about asset acquisition planning. What kinds of assets? There's many different kinds of assets out there. You know, there's liquid assets. Liquid assets are just anything that, can, that is either cash or can be converted to cash fast. Has nothing to do with water, has nothing to do with boats. You will have a question, I guarantee you, on a, on a quiz or something that say, 
what is not, what is an example of a liquid asset? And I'll even put, try to trick you and put a boat in there. And some people still answer the boat. It's not good. We got noodles to do. Um, um, so there's different type of assets. There's liquid assets, which is assets that either are currently just cash is a liquid asset. Savings can be turned into cash really quick. Money markets can be turned in, or money market accounts can be turned into cash quick. We'll get into the difference of those um, later in the semester as well. Investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds are, are, are the, the main types of investments. Personal property, personal property is, is essentially any type of property that is movable. That would be autos, household furnishings, appliances, collectibles as well. Um, appliances, clothing, jewelry, home electronics, anything that has value and you can easily, it's easily movable or portable. Then real property. When you think real property, think real estate, right? So real property, land, homes, investment properties. Those are the main types of um, um, assets. <clears throat> We're into liability and insurance planning in this class too. Um, when we do this class in person, I would say it's a bad joke that if you felt like, you know, if the doctor told you only had three hours to live, the classes won't take three hours. You only had three, you had three hours to live. And uh, I would advise you that you go listen to something about life insurance during that time, because it's going to seem like you're in a life for an eternity after listening to how dry life insurance and insurance can be. And I used to sell insurance. That's coming from a guy who used to, used to sell this stuff. So um, we'll talk about liability and insurance planning. What is a liability? Essentially, um, that's just what you owe, your debt, anything outstanding you're responsible for. And there's, so you see some funny definitions like outstanding in the world, in the real world, outstanding is like, that's great. Outstanding, that's pretty cool. That's great, it's incredible. Great, you know? In fine, the world of finance, outstanding is not good. Outstanding is what you owe, essentially. If you have an outstanding balance, that doesn't mean you have a great balance. That means you owe money, okay? That is still out there. And for some people, it's like, it's that little thing that I just, that little nugget I just dropped is, there's, or, very, very, very useful um, uh, terminology. Um, insurance. Uh, like, what's the purpose of insurance? The big purpose of insurance, here's a listen to this word, indemnification. I speak in the insurance racket. Indemnification is just it makes you whole when something unforeseen happens. So if you ever have problems with your insurance, you have your auto insurance or you have something stolen, you just say, I want to be indemnified. And everybody in insurance knows exactly what you're talking about. That means to be made whole. And that's the purpose of insurance. Insurance is not to make you better than you were before the accident uh, or before, before the, the cause of loss or the peril. And, uh, insurance is to make you whole. If you want to be made better, you can potentially, you know, you know, pursue litigation and say that, you know, that, that you were, there were some damages. Um, but essentially insurance, the purpose of insurance is to make you whole. We get into an, a savings and investment planning. Initially, you want to have an emergency fund. And we'll get into different um, theories about emergency funds. Uh, then you can transition into creating a nest egg and growth. Something for your, for your, um, for long-term, uh, for, for, uh, you know, for your retirement. We'll get into employer benefit planning, which is, you know, like 401ks. If you don't know what a 401k is, that's fine. We'll walk you through it. Get into pensions. If you don't know what that is, no problem. Walk you through that too. We'll get into profit sharing, healthcare, how important that healthcare is um, for decision, for, dis, uh, uh, for financial planning and decision-making purposes and pay time off, how important that is. We'll talk a little bit about tax planning as well. And that's, this is kind of really kind of fluid and changing depending upon um, uh, which parties in control and the president and, 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 um, um, and politics. Simply figure that's simple. And also thinking about, okay, right now, you know, we have, we have, you know, JB, Joe Biden as the president. He's going to have a certain philosophy about, you know, um, tax, taxes and tax rates kind of know that kind of like, okay, towards the end of, uh, uh, of, of his time as president, if he's gonna run for re-election or it looks like he, uh, or if he wants to either run for re-election or if he's gonna be go from a Democrat to Republican, how that can potentially affect your, your tax plan. And that's a, that, that is a real consideration. And we'll get into politics, if which one's better, which one's um, worse. It's just, it's just real stuff to, to consider how, how, how the two parties um, really look at um, 
uh, at taxes and the um, and the importance of taxes and the role and the functionality of taxes. So tax planning is just simply figuring out um, how how your earnings are impacted by taxes. We'll get into the difference between tax evasion, tax evasion, and tax avoidance. One is good, one is fine, one is perfectly legal, and is everything is within your rights to do one. Other one is definitely not. We're getting retirement estate planning. We talked about that just briefly. IRAs, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. We're talking the SEPT IRAs, self-employed IRAs, which is you, know, you can put away a lot of money with these SEPT IRAs, and then Roth IRAs as well. Special planning concerns, we'll get into that. How, you know, sometimes managing two incomes in a, uh, in a, in a relationship, in a couple. You have, two, you, you, have, you, have, you have a married couple, you have two incomes coming in. What's the best way to manage that? Uh, and managing your employee benefits, because not all employers are the same. They can have a huge impact on, on life decisions. Some people will, can stay with the company for a long time, even though it's not a great company, because they have a really good because they have really good benefits. That's kind of one of the um, um, goals of the Affordable Care Act, or known as Obamacare, so that people would um, have more mobility or portability with with, with their health care, and not potentially be stuck in a in, in a company just because of the benefits. But sometimes that still does happen. Talk about managing in tough economic times as well. You know, the better you are prepared and plan, the less painful this can be. There's always going to be, you know, um, some, some things are gonna, they're, they're going to come up. Let me take the next slide here. Yeah. They're, they're going to come up and uh, knock you on your butt, knock you on your face. It's okay. Recessions happen. Financial crisis happen. COVID happened, which was, I mean, no one saw that coming. And even the best financial planners out there, I mean, you saw the rich get richer. And um, if, so hopefully you can have some good tools, some good practices. And, but don't, I plead with you for this class, do not think about, okay, I, I can't save this much. I can't, I, I can't save, put this much away in savings. And I can't, you know, uh, afford a house like this. I can't, it's, if you can't check all these boxes that we're gonna go through the class, that's fine. A lot of people can't, but as long as you are just thinking things through and you're thinking differently about financial decisions that's kind of, and you're more aware thinking things through you're more aware of uh, financial decisions as well it's that's i think the big um takeaway from this class how to survive a huge financial crisis again if you ever take a class called um macroeconomics macroeconomics is essentially looking at how the economy well how the economy works on the macro scale like how monetary policy works how um, through the government, how the changing of interest rates, how that kind of changes the flow of, 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 of cash and money, uh, you know, through the economy. Um, that, those are big things. How different tax um, implications affect everything. Um, microeconomics is, this class is basically a microeconomics class. You probably didn't realize it. And microeconomics, I had a great instructor in my master's, in, in my went to grad school, and he said, Microeconomics, you can sum it up right here. This is all you need to know is spend less than you earn. That's it. That's microeconomics right now, right there. And how do you have those good habits to spend less than you earn? A microeconomics class essentially like is like a money management class. So you're, you, can you can tell people I'm taking money management or uh, personal finance or this class is called now. You can also say this is essentially a microeconomics class. Makes you sound really smart. That's the thing. If you can sound smart, that, that, that's uh, it's pretty important. Uh, how to survive if you do huge financial questions is the second point keep investing no don't stop keep doing it um look for those because I, you know what in part of my day job i uh helped man or did manage the master's in real estate program at, at chapman and one of the uh this big executive for a huge home development company came in and he talked about um look for those huge variances in the economy when everything's going smooth sailing, that's when you don't want to make moves. You want to make your moves when everything's either going really, really, really great, that's when you sell off, or things are really, really, really bad, that's when your opportunity is to buy. So that's when you think about the, you know, you know, buy low, sell high. Um, know when you are, uh, know where you are and plan for the unexpected. So be honest kind of with where you are. The emergency fund, six months cash, sometimes three months, six months. So Essentially, you should you your emergency fund ideally. There's a guy named Dave Ramsey. I'll kind of expose you a little bit too. He says you should have an emergency fund of a thousand dollars. That's the start. 
And that sometimes that can be tough. I went through times in my life, I'm like, I can't put that, put in that extra thousand dollars. I can barely, you know, make it by right now. And that's fine, you know, um, but just to, to, to think these things through. He says, first, you should have $1,000 uh, in a little baby emergency fund. Then maybe have three months earnings, meaning whatever you would make in a month, you times it by three, and that's how much you be in your emergency savings. But the commonly accepted one is six months. If you have six months of emergency savings, that means if, you, if the world fell apart, you lost your jobs, you didn't have any other type of income, you have at least six months to figure it out. Um, and start by doing it, doing it now. I said, put the Jersey Boys down there. I don't know if you know this. There's a, there was a movie, there was a play, a musical called the, Jer the Jersey Boys about Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons. I highly recommend it. It's, it's very entertaining. But they said, in a part in that movie where the band was just getting, this is like in this, like 50s or 60s. I know a long time ago. And um, they were just about ready to make it big. And one of the guys in the band got, or these guys are from Jersey. So kind of like, like mob mobish, mobster-esque. Um, we're just, you know, always getting in trouble. One of them got in trouble, got arrested, went to prison right before they're going to make it big. It's like, okay, all right, that's fine. We're just sidetracked, you know, for a few months. Right as that guy's getting out of jail, another guy, like this, basically the same day or the next day, goes into jail. And so there's like, oh my gosh. And in the movie, they basically said, hey, in life, um, nothing's going to always be smooth and going too well for too long you're eventually you're going to fall on your face okay but you're not going to be there forever you're not going to be down forever but also know you're not always going to be up forever so always be prepared for something to happen that's why you need to start start have a good money management plan we'll get into the planning environment the three main contributors for the planning environment the government which is the federal government state government local government both cost and give money to the economy, to, to the economy, meaning that, you know, there's, uh, you know, it doesn't, it costs money to, you know, to run local governments or, you know, police, fire, improvements, that's the cost. And they also give money to the economy by, um, by like government contracts and keeping people employed. And that money, this, that money that, that, that they pay out to employees goes right back into the economy. They have, they go out to eat. They, you know, go to the grocery store, they, you know, it will buy gas, they will buy tires, they'll buy all these kind of things. So they both, uh, they cost money and they, and they contribute money. Uh, business, they provide, uh, um, they contribute to the economy, but then they also have costs. There's only three main players, but the biggest player are consumers. It's the most powerful, they're the, they're the most powerful with the flow of money. They determine the kinds of goods and services provided by the government and business. We, as the consumers, have the most power. Um, or flex the most muscles, um, whether we want, whether we want to or want to believe it or not. We're talking to the, get about the economy, which is I just talked a little bit more about you know the um, difference between mac micro and macroeconomics. Um, the macro is a monetary policy, control the amount of money in the circulation, the money supply, to stimulate or moderate economic growth. The higher the supply of money, then the lower the interest rates and vice versa. And then fiscal policy is just how spending and taxation works at the, at, at the government level. This is good stuff right here. It's probably being a quiz, I guess. Um, econ there's something, oh, not the economic data. There's something really good called the economic data report that comes out every week, a couple times a week. And that just basically is a, is a um, combination of all the economists from around the, around the country. And they have uh, essentially questionnaires. And they kind of, that's basically the finger on the pulse of the economy. You follow that the economic, just type in economic data report and you can see the calendar and it comes out, you know, every uh, multiple times a week. That's when the jobs numbers comes out. That's when um, like the payroll numbers comes out. That's when um, the like new housing start numbers come out. That's um, uh, when purchasing, purchasing agents around, from around the country find out how much they're actually purchasing in good, in, um, in, raw, in raw materials and supplies for stuff. Those are always good indi indicators of where the economy is going. GDP, this is kind of a big kind of uh, high level concept. That's just the gross domestic product. That's how basically you kind of test the and um, uh, assess the viability and the strength of, uh, of a nation's um, economy. And basically it's this, I know you guys are probably writing this on uh, 
your foggy shower doors, you know, just to remember this uh, earlier today is the, uh, in, in, with your finger, C plus G plus I plus NX. What is that? C, consumer spending. You add consumer spending to government spending, add in investments, people, people making investments, and then you also add in net exports. That's exports minus imports. What's the difference between how much we're, how much we're as, a, as a nation, we're sending out exporting of our goods compared to what we're bringing in? This is a really, really, really important slide and, and a really, really, really big uh, concept that most people don't talk about, talk about inflation, prices, and planning. There's something called the CPI, which is a consumer price index. On average, consumer prices increase by 3.22% every year. Some people say 3%, some people say 3.5%. You go in the middle about 3.22%. And what, is, what does that mean? That means that has a lot to do with your, with your purchasing power. That means what they do, consumer price index, is they take, um, I forget how many goods, but these are some goods, there's like bread, milk, eggs. Then they'll take, you know, like, you know, the same pair of uh, jeans or t-shirts, shoes, tire. There's a, a ton of products that they put in this bucket, essentially. And they see what those prices, how those prices change year over year. And on average, they go up by 3.22% every year. Why is this important? This is important because if you are not making 3.22% more every year, you're losing purchasing power. You have less, your money is not as strong. So when you're in a job and, and you want to ask about, you know, are there potential for raises? And some people do this it's called a COLA, which is cost of living allowance, um, which is a, um, uh, so, you, so most, some companies will automatically give you a merit, they call, either you can call it a merit raise or a COLA allowance, which is a cost of living allowance, so that you can, so you can make that extra 3.22% a year so that you're not, so you're not losing ground, you're not kind of going backwards. Um, so either you have to make 3.22% every year or cut back on your expenses by 3.22% by, by every year to kind of ma maintain the, um, the lifestyle. So basically, so look, think about it this way. That, that $100, if you have $100 today and you went to the grocery store or you went out and spent it on, on random goods, in one year, theoretically, those same goods would cost you $103.22. It would not cost you $103 or $100. And then the next year, it would cost 3.22% higher than $103.22. Hopefully that makes sense. That's it. That's all I got for you. Um, so um, you will have quizzes and I will put that information up um, uh, as soon as I have it. Thanks. Bye. Oh, I got to stop.